So as I was preparing this year's Shavuot teaching, I just kept on coming back to the story of Boaz and Ruth. And that's really what's going to be the foundation of this year's study. Um, you know, the story of Boaz and Ruth has got so much prophecy in it. We know that Boaz is also representative of the Messiah. It's the story of the bride and the groom. It's also a story of the redemption of the Gentile bride. And that speaks to a lot of us that are starting to go back to our Hebrew roots. There's a lot of prophecy as well, where the Lord says that he's calling his bride out of the nations where she was scattered. Um, it's the story of making a commitment to the covenant and the commandments of God. Uh, it's the story of the Kingsman Redeemer. So there's so much prophecy built into this short book that we find in the Bible. And I want to encourage you to go and read the story of Ruth. There's only five or six chapters in it. It's really a quick read, uh, but very deep and profound. And it's also something that is traditionally done during Shavuot. The book of Ruth is read because it starts with the barley harvest, which is at Passover. And then we've got it working its way through to the wheat harvest, which would bring us to Shavuot. So we've got that beginning of the feast cycle with Passover, the counting of the Omer, and then bringing us to this beautiful feast of Shavuot. So that's really going to be the foundation of what we're going to look into this year. And, you know, as I was working on this study, um, you're always looking for something that you haven't seen before, looking for that that thing that's going to make it profound and deep and that's going to bless everyone's spirit. And I was just reminded of Yeshua, our Messiah, and when he was on earth, um, you know, sometimes his stories and parables and the things he said were very simple. They were simple enough for a child to understand. But in the simplicity was the profoundness. So this message really is a very simple message. It's a message of the bride preparing herself. But I pray that the Lord will really touch your heart the way that it's touched mine and that your spirit will be confronted, your soul will be confronted with those very important questions that we stop and ask over these feast times that we find during the year. So without further ado, let's start. So every feast is a seal. When you show up for a feast, you are sealed. There's something that you sealed in. Um, and I encourage you to go and look at Dr. Lisa Alavine's uh, series that she does on the creation gospel, because you'll see that she takes the seven feasts and she explains to you how there's a manifestation of the spirit of God that moves in every one of those feast days. And that's the spirit that you sealed in. So when you show up for the feast, you are sealed in that specific spirit that's manifesting during that feast. At the end of the feast cycle, if you've shown up for all seven feasts, you will have seven seals. And at Shavuot, you're being sealed as the bride. So you'll see that this is the fourth feast in the feast cycle. Four always speaks to authority. This is also the center branch of the menorah. So if you look at the menorah, this is the fourth branch, but this is the center that everything else stems out of. Um, and this is really the heart of Torah, is the Holy Spirit. And that is what Jesus was teaching when he was on earth. He was saying, you're keeping the letter of the law, but you've lost the spirit of the law. And we should always be walking in balance. Shavuot is the time when we are filled with the spirit of God. We know that at Mount Sinai, God uh, appeared to them when he was giving them the Ten Commandments. And it says there that everyone that was there, um, could hear him speak in their own language and could make that covenant with him. And many years later, when Jesus died and the apostles were waiting, the disciples were waiting during the Feast of Shavuot, they started speaking in many tongues and bringing a powerful message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And many of the Jews that had lost their first love returned to the covenant, accepted the Messiah and were filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's a direct link with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the giving of the commandments. And it's really difficult to keep the commandments without the Holy Spirit helping us. And it's really difficult having the Holy Spirit and not going back to the commandments because the Holy Spirit's work, his job, is to always take us back to the commandments. 
So Shavuot is the celebration of the first fruit of the wheat harvest. So we bring an offering to God of our first fruit to say thank you for his abundant provision. And that's why during the Feast of Shavuot, a lot of the decorations will be fruit. Um, but we're also going to look at uh, how that falls through in terms of the Spirit of God and the fruit of the Spirit. It's also the commemorating of the receiving of the Torah at the foot of Mount Sinai. So again, we see that um, there's provision in, in Torah. So when you inside of it, we actually looked at it in last week's Bible study, is that inside of Torah, there is protection, provision, life, um, everything that's beautiful we find inside of Torah. And it's also a picture for us of the engagement or a wedding proposal. So when a, a, a Jewish bride and his, uh, a Jewish groom and bride get married, when, when they get engaged, he gives her a wedding proposal. So he gives her a ketubah where he commits to do certain things, but there are also things that's expected of the bride. And this is what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai. God came and he said, I want to marry you. I want to have an intimate relationship with you, like I had in the garden before the sin of Adam and Eve. And he asked them, will you accept my terms and conditions? And three times in that uh, accounting of what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai, the, the Israelites said, we will hear and we will do. So three times they confirmed that they were accepting this wedding proposal. So um, it's very important to understand that you cannot separate the acceptance of Torah and the Holy Spirit. Also, if we speak about the fruit of the Spirit, People sometimes read it and they get confused. They think that it's something that you feel. It's an emotion, like if you think of love. And it isn't. Love is an act. It's something that you do. Praise as well. Joy, those kind of things. It's not stuff that you feel. It's something that you decide to do. But in your own strength, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's only by being filled by the Spirit, that we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. So we shouldn't be um, trying to have the fruit of the Spirit. That, that's not the first step. Uh, the first step is to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit and to allow that seed to bring forth fruit. And again, the Holy Spirit will never take you away from the commandments of God. The job of the Holy Spirit is to always take us back to the commandments back to the land of Israel, back to the covenant. The counting of the Omer starts the day after Passover. So remember, that was just a few weeks ago that this feast cycle started with Passover. And then for seven sevens, for seven Sabbaths, we count. And then on the 50th day, we've got Shavuot. And this is a time of preparation through repentance. And this is a, something that you're going to see with the all the feasts that we go through is there's always a time that God gives us for repentance and for preparation. And that's why I believe the word also says that there's going to be a time when you will want to repent, but you won't be able to. Because although God in his infinite mercy and grace gives us a lot of time to repent and to turn back to the covenant, there is going to be a feast day. And it's going to be the day the, the shofars are going to sound and, and that's going to be it. You won't be able to go through that process of preparation and repentance anymore. And that's really what the counting of the Omer was all about. It was again about self-reflection, looking into yourself and preparing yourself and cleansing yourself through repentance. It's a time of sanctification, of putting the things that are unholy aside and ensuring that we're living a life that is truly uh, relatable to a kingdom of priests, that if people look at our lives, they can see that we're not allowing the unholy to mix with the holy. And very importantly, because of our whole theme this year, being the bride and the groom is the preparation of the bride. The bride is getting herself ready through this act of repentance and preparing and sanctifying herself so that she can meet with the groom. The bridegroom, which is also a picture, Boaz is a picture of the bridegroom for us. During this time of counting down there, he is observing the bride. So Ruth started gleaning on the corners of Boaz's field 
uh, during the barley harvest, which is at the beginning of Passover. And during that time, through the barley harvest and through the wheat harvest, she was gleaning in Boaz's field and he was watching her. He was looking at how she conducts herself, how she speaks, what she does. Is she keeping the commandments? Is she faithful, really? Because remember, she came from Moab. She was not a native born Israelite. And so that's the same for us. During this time of the counting of the Omer, from the beginning of Passover until Shavuot, it's really a time when the bridegroom is watching us. He's watching what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're thinking, how we're conducting ourselves. And he's weighing and seeing, is this the type of woman that I want to marry? Is this someone that is a living stone that I can use to build the new Jerusalem that we see in Revelation as the bride coming down from heaven. So in Revelation 19 verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And this is such a beautiful verse, but there's a, a, a specific phrase here that I want to highlight. And it's the bride has made herself ready and that's really the message that i want to leave with you this year is that there is a preparation that every one of us have to do ourselves the bridegroom does not make the bride ready your community is not going to make the bride ready you yourself if you see yourself as the bride of messiah you need to make yourself ready there's certain things that you need to get rid of in your life. There's certain things that you need to change. You need to go back to the word of God and look at his commandments and ask, what is pleasing to my future husband? What does he want for me? What is, how does he expect me to dress myself spiritually, to conduct myself? What are the thoughts of the bride? What are the words of the bride? What are the actions of the bride? And those things that we see that do not conform to the image of God's bride, that's what we need to work on and change. And that's what these grace periods before every feast is for, that time of preparation and repentance and sanctification. That is the, what we should spend this time on. And then as we go into Shavuot, to look at ourselves, to really see how did we grow and change from the previous Shavuot? Did we grow and change? And also, what do we still see? What can we still identify that doesn't fit the image of the bride? So Ruth is a beautiful picture of the bride of Messiah. Boaz tells Ruth to remain in his field. And that's important because we know that the field is also representative of the world. And we need to know what field we are laboring in. Are you laboring in things that have not got value in terms of internal life or are you laboring in the kingdom of god the bride of messiah will not go outside his field his field is also where his protection and provision is which takes us back to torah which is also an integral part of this very special feast the story of ruth is all about the redemption of the bride so it's the redeeming of the bride by the kingsman redeemer but also it's the story to tell us that Gentiles can be brought back into the covenant of God if they are committed, if they love the Lord, if what they do is an act of love and not out of uh, fear or out of what I can get out of it. We see that Boaz specifically tells Ruth that she is a woman of character and that even um, the, the judges of the town that, that are sitting in the gateway to the town, they know that she is a woman of character. And how do they know that she's a woman of character? They know because they have been watching her since she came back with Naomi and she started at Passover to glean the fields, to keep that one commandment. She only knew one commandment. She knew that the widow and the orphan and the foreigner was allowed to glean the corners of the field. Actually, the Torah says that you are not allowed to harvest the corners of your fields. You're supposed to leave that for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow. And she was a foreigner and a widow. She only knew that one commandment, but she walked in that one commandment, and that opened up 
the rest of the commandments to her so she could learn. And that's what's important about our walk with God as well. Sometimes we don't know everything, but it's a journey. And as you walk in um, obedience, as you listen to what he says and you do what he says, even if you don't understand it, we start walking in that path that Ruth walked. And it shapes our character. And that's what the bridegroom is looking for. He's inspecting his bride and he's looking for a woman of character. And very important about Ruth, remember Naomi and her husband and her two sons moved away from the promised land. They moved to Moab. But Ruth is also a picture of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will always take us back to the land, back to the covenant, back to the commandments, and back to the people of God. Again, we can see this relation between the Holy Spirit and the Torah. You cannot have the one without the other. Now, I want to talk quickly about the three siftings that we find in the Word of God. And why do we call it the three siftings? Well, if you think of Jesus that spoke to Peter, and he said to him that, um, Peter, you must beware because Satan has requested permission to sift you. And God allows us to be sifted. And there's three specific times of the year that there's sifting that takes place. In Exodus 34 verse 23, it says, Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Lord Adonai, the God of Israel. So those three times are the three feasts, they, they call them the three foot festivals, because those were the times that you would walk up to Jerusalem. And we know that it's very difficult today, yes, we can travel, but you know, it's, it's not possible for everyone to go to the land of Israel, to go to Jerusalem for those three foot festivals. But that is, Jerusalem is not only a geographical place physically on earth, there's also a spiritual Jerusalem. And when you show up for the three feasts, when you keep them, when you keep the Sabbaths that are related to them, and you bring yourself as a living sacrifice, in the spirit realm, you are going up to the spiritual Jerusalem. You are meeting with God at his appointed times and seasons. And those three times are Pesach that we had a few weeks ago, Shavuot, which is uh, the feast that we'll be having this year and um, now in this season, and then the last one is Sukkot. So that, those are the three foot festivals. Then we've got the three other, the four other festivals that are in between those. But those are the three times a year that God says that there will be sifting that is taking place. And if we look at Daniel 20, uh, 5 verse 27, it says, you are weighed on the balance scale and came up short. That's another thing. Our hearts are weighed during these three uh, fruit festivals during the feast of the Lord, we are being weighed, and God forbid that we come up short, that our fruit is not of such a quality that it can be a first fruit offering to our Lord. So, I want to talk a little bit about wheat because wheat is what we celebrate, the wheat harvest is what we celebrate during the feast of Shavuot. And if you keep this at the back of your mind, that we are being sifted during the Feast of Shavuot as well. I want to talk about the process that they would go through in ancient times to get wheat from the harvested product to a baked loaf of bread. Because we also see that during the Feast of Shavuot, we bring two breads as a wave offering before the Lord. So the first thing that took place with, was threshing. And threshing is the process of removing the grain of wheat or barley from the stalk and husk. The threshing was done in different ways, depending on how much grain there was and the tools the farmer had available to him. Essential to threshing was a threshing floor, a flat area of hard dirt or rock on which freshly harvested wheat could be piled. So that's the first thing. And often during feast times, before Pesach, before Shavuot, before Sukkot, we find ourselves really being uh, challenged by difficult times, maybe in relationships, in your health, in your finances. And that's a part of threshing. God is allowing that difficulty to come into your life because he's trying to separate the grain that can actually be used, so the fruit of the wheat, from the stalk and the husk that's really not very nutrition dense. 
So if you find yourself going through difficult times, allow the Lord to separate the fruit of the grain or the, the, the fruit of the wheat from the stalk and the husks. The second thing is winnowing. And winnowing was the process that separated the mixed up pile of grain, stalk and husk so the edible grain could be sifted and eaten. To winnow the grain, the farmer scooped up the pieces of the crop he had just threshed and threw it all up in the air. The wind blew the light pieces of stalk to the side while the grain, which was both heavier and roundish, fell almost straight back down. This is such a beautiful picture because we also know that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is often represented as a wind. Um, and so if we allow the Holy Spirit to blow over us as we are thrown into these trials and tribulations, it blows away the stalk and the husks because there's no weight in them. There's nothing of substance in them. But what's left behind is the fruit, the weight of substance. Um, and that is the fruit that grew in the past year. So from the previous shovel to now, what has come up in your life uh, in terms of the seed that was sown? Thus, over time, the threshing floor was covered with three quite distinct piles of material. The kernels of grain fell almost straight down or were not blown far at all. The largest pieces of stalk or straw had blown a little ways off to the side and the small pieces of stalk called the chaff had blown even further away. Another thing that's important is the threshing floor is the place of revelation. It's a place of showing that we are close to God and to his commandments. And we can see here that part of this winnowing process, uh, certain pieces of the wheat get blown further and further away from the threshing floor. If you are heavy with fruit, you won't go far from the commandments of God. You will stay close to the threshing floor. But if you are not heavy with uh, fruit, if you were weighed and found lacking, then it would be easy for the wind to blow you away. Then we're looking at the seed. That was the third process. Now, remember, we're looking at the process for them to be able to start making bread out of this wheat. So just before the grain was ground into flour, it was seeded. This was necessary for a number of reasons. For one thing, it was common in the harvesting that weed seeds got mixed in with the wheat. So weeds got mixed in with the wheat. And threshing and winnowing did not separate the different seeds. Furthermore, the winnowing process did not get all the chaff from the grain. Also, in picking the grain off the threshing floor, dust and pebbles were mixed in with the grain. So we can see here that there's three different phases of separation that takes place to prepare the wheat to ground it to flour and to make bread. Takes us back to the three siftings and the three, three feasts. And we can see even on the very last, with the seed, there still could be some weed seeds that are mixed in there that's not part of the wheat. And how do you know who the seed belongs to? Because we know that there's the seed of the serpent and there's the seed of the woman. And that the Lord says that there will be enmity between the seed. And we want to make sure that the fruit that comes up in our lives are not weeds that start growing. Because that is the seed of Satan. We want to ensure that when that seed goes into the ground and it brings forth fruit, that it is the fruit of the image of God. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit that is growing in our lives. Matthew 13 verse 24 to 39 makes a lot more sense that we've looked at this process of the separation, the three separations of the wheat. Yeshua put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the weeds, then went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The servants asked him, Then do you want us to go and pull them up? But he said, No, because if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot some of the wheat at the same time. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time, I will tell the reapers to collect the weeds first, tie them in bundles to be burned, but together, but to gather the wheat into my barn. 
this is such a beautiful parable that makes so much more sense now. Because when is the harvest times? We know that the harvest times, biblically, was synced with the three feasts of Adonai. We've got the barley harvest at the beginning of Pesach. We've got the wheat harvest at Shavuot. And then everything else that's harvested, your fruit and olives and grapes and all of those things are related to um, Sukkot. So when Yeshua says, let them grow together until harvest time, what is he speaking about? What is the harvest time? He's speaking about the feasts. And how will you know if you're a wheat or a weed is when it comes to harvest time, when it comes to the feast times, you will see who gets gathered together. So what does God say? He says, but to gather the wheat into my barn. So during the feast times, those that are wheat will be gathering together to meet with Adonai at his appointed times. But those that are weak will not be gathering at the feast times. And that's really a very important distinction. And if you don't understand the Torah and you don't understand the feasts of Adonai and when the harvest times are, it's very difficult to read this parable and to have the correct context for it. During the feast days, the wheat and the tares are separated. They may look the same, but they act differently when the appointed times come. How do we know what wheat is? Well, wheat will be heavy with fruit. So because it's heavy, it will bend down in humility because it's heavy with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the tares will stay straight and they are raised up in pride. And that's how we will know. Those that humble themselves, that submit their own desires and emotions and whatever they want to do, they submit it to Adonai. They say, Lord, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to keep your commandments and I'm going to meet you on your feast days. They are heavy with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 7 verse 16 to 20 says, you will recognize them by their fruit. Can people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit or a poor tree good fruit. Any tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So you will recognize them by their fruit. So we can see the same thing happening to the weed and to the trees that don't produce good fruit. They're cut down and thrown into the fire. What is the fire? A lot of people think it's hell. It's not hell. You're not going to hell because you're not keeping the commandments or because you're not bearing fruit. You are being put through God's um, trials and tribulations. He is going to try to correct your behavior. He's bringing discipline. That's what the fire is. So if you're constantly going through the fire, you must maybe stop and do introspection and ask yourself, am I a wheat or am I a weed? Am I producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit? And again, the Holy Spirit will always take you back to the commandments. It will never take you away from the commandments. So what, um, while well, the two loaves represent quite a lot of things, but what I want to talk about today is what the two loaves as a way of offering represent for us. If we look at this whole story of the wheat and the weed, you know, after the wheat has gone through the process of uh, threshing and winnowing and being sieved, it gets ground up. And from that, the two breads are baked. And in Romans 12, verse 1, it says, So brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. So a part of what those two loaves represent is also us coming as that loaf that has gone through the sifting process, the separation process, and that's filled with the fruit of the wheat so that God can make a bread out of us and we can be a living sacrifice to him. And I want to finish off with this. In Jeremiah 2, verse 1 to 2, it really um, touched me. And this is the message that I want to leave with you. It says, the word of Adonai came to me and, and said, go and shout in the ears of Jerusalem that this is what Adonai says. I remember your devotion when you were young. How as a bride you loved me, how you followed me through the desert, 
through a land not sown. And this is the, the message that I really felt the Lord imparting in my heart this year with Shavuot, is challenging me about my first love. You know how we start out when we go back to our Hebrew roots and we really discover where our Messiah came from and everything is new and everything is beautiful and we're so excited by everything and we've got so much faith in the Lord and how sometimes through life and through the process we forgot our devotion and our love as a young bride how we even followed him through the wilderness and we didn't complain and now the slightest little inconvenience causes us to complain in revelation 2 verse 4 the lord says but i have this charge against you that you have left your first love you have lost the depth of love that you first had for me and so that is what I want us to meditate on and to focus on and to pray for the Holy Spirit to show us where we have lost our first love. May we go back to the commandments with the same enthusiasm, with the same joy and excitement and commitment that we did when we first heard the message of the gospel of the good news. May you have a very blessed Shavuot with your family.